Philadelphia. Um, I am also uh, a member of SAEM and GEMA and our new humanitarian task force, which I'll talk a little bit, and I'll be uh, moderating this panel of really great uh, panelists um, who are EM providers and PEM providers and um, some staff from MSF. So the title of today's talk is Working with MSF, a view from EM and PEM physicians. Um, and uh, I wanna just get started. Um, before we start to introduce the panel and uh, get on with um, the discussion today, I wanted to just put in a little plug, um, particularly I assume that many of you are interested in global health, global emergency medicine, and or humanitarian health. And uh, I would definitely put in a plug to uh, come join our, uh, our group, at SAEM. Um, the website is is below. Um, and then specifically the Global Emergency, Emergency Medicine Academy or GEMA. There's a number of uh, different committees that are part of uh, GEMA and I've listed some of them below. Uh, the most recent one is called the Humanitarian Task Force, um, which uh, this is actually the first event that we have hosted as a result of the Humanitarianism Task Force. We're a new group of people who are interested in thinking about humanitarianism from a scholarly perspective, from an academic perspective, um, in terms of partnering with communities and um, humanitarian partners in the field. Um, so uh, this is definitely a new uh, task force that's being shaped by the people who are uh, being a part of it. So feel free to join um, SAEM. You can also contact me directly if you have any questions about GMA or the Humanitarian Task Force. So today we have a number of panelists. Um, so Michael, Mahati, and David are uh, three emergency medicine physicians, Mahati being a pediatric emergency medicine physician, who have varying uh, degrees of experience with MSF. And so they'll kind of provide some initial perspectives of their experience with MSF. And we also have Chelsea and Melissa from the field HR team. So uh, what I would um, ask you guys to do is uh, please type in your questions in the chat room. Um, in the interest of time and keeping the panel flowing, um, I will probably defer questions until the very end, um, but I will keep track of questions as they come along and um, we can try to have a discussion at the very end. So um, thank you very much. And we're gonna start with Michael. Hi, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Michael John. I'm an emergency physician. Um, I'm going to spend about five to 10 minutes talking about my experience working with MSF, and I'll talk a little bit about specific um, challenges and issues that face uh, physicians trained in the USA uh, when they work with uh, in humanitarian contacts with organizations like MSF. Uh, as a quick disclaimer for all the physicians on the panel, of course, uh, we have all worked with MSF, uh, but uh, the views and uh, what we express in this panel are our individual views and may not recognize may not represent the views of MSF or other organizations that we're affiliated with. So with that, um, I trained in emergency medicine at Baylor. I graduated residency in 2016. Uh, I completed a two-year fellowship in global health and international emergency me medicine at Baylor. And at the end of the fellowship, I applied uh, for MSF for the second time and I was accepted into the pool. Uh, I went on my first assignment in January of 2019. Uh, this was a pediatric hospital assignment in Eastern Sierra Leone. Uh, and I actually went to this project twice, once for my first assignment, which was six months, and a second assignment, which was three months long and coincided with the onset of the COVID pandemic. Uh, since the onset of the COVID pandemic, I have worked in uh, five different contexts with MSF, Brazil, Lebanon, Peru, Malawi, uh, which was a total of two assignments and the Occupy Palestinian territories. I just returned from my last assignment in Malawi, uh, February this year, uh, responding to the Omicron um, wave in Malawi and Southern Africa. In these assignments, I've taken multiple roles, um, pre predominantly as an emergency physician, uh, but in the COVID projects, I've also uh, worked uh, in sort of co uh, coincided positions or of technical support and managing medical activities. I'll talk a little bit about what that specifically meant when I was working in Peru. But in general, I've been involved in all my projects in direct patient care and in those projects as technical supporter, as a manager, uh, and additionally supervising managing teams and collaborating with local partners, uh, particularly Ministry of Health facilities. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a snapshot from the MSF activity report late 2020, uh, focusing on the COVID response in the Americas. Uh, this was the first time in MSF's history that we had a, a clinical project in the USA. 
uh, in my hometown of Houston, uh, MSF opened up a project to support uh, infection prevention control training uh, in nursing homes. Uh, of course, there were many active projects in Central and South America focused on refugees and migrants. Uh, and during COVID, uh, many different activities opened up in these different countries. Uh, I was in two projects in Brazil, one in the north in the heart of the Amazon and one in the south. And in Peru, I was helping with two different projects, one based out of Lima and one in the Cusco region. Next slide, please. So I'll talk a little bit more about Peru specifically. So I was there uh, in the, between February and May of, of last year. Uh, during this time, uh, at the end of the summer of 2021, uh, Peru had the estimated highest excess mortality due to COVID in the world. In comparison to a similarly populated country of Canada, they had seven times as many deaths. Uh, MSF opened up some activities uh, during the first wave in um, late 2020. Uh, and we opened up some new projects in Lima and Cusco uh, during the gamma wave of 2021. Uh, I was predominantly in Huacho, which is a city in Northern Lima. And we had a three-pronged project. We were involved at the community level supporting uh, Ministry of Health teams that were doing home-based treatment, care, and monitoring of isolated patients. Uh, we created, we retrofitted a recreation center into an isolation and treatment facility uh, to add capacity to the, um, to the local regional hospital, which had been overwhelmed with COVID patients. And lastly, we were involved in that regional hospital, providing some technical support at the ICU and an intermediate care level. So what did that mean on a day-to-day -day basis? So for me, as the medical activity manager in this project, uh, I was responsible for supervising the patient care in our isolation and treatment facility. So when we arrived, uh, we had basically this recreation facility that we had to figure out how to outfit with oxygen, appropriate uh, electricity for oxygen generators, appropriate water uh, and, and waste disposal and, and in, advance, in addition to all of the um, infection, other infection prevention control measures. Uh, we work with the Ministry of Health to figure out uh, what cadre of patients or what tier of patient care we were gonna be able to provide in this temporary facility and how we would be able to accept referrals from both the hospital, but also from the community-based teams, um, what treatment guidelines we would follow and what would be the criteria for discharge or cure. Uh, this was a process that really took weeks. Uh, to, it depended on a huge team of logisticians to move in supplies and hardware, both internationally, but also procuring it locally uh, to outfit them, to create the, the protocols and the referral criteria to hire doctors and nurses uh, to keep the facility staff 24 seven and to, uh, and then finally to open up the facility, take patients and provide good medical care and psychosocial support to these patients who are isolating or uh, being treated for severe COVID. Uh, in addition to supervising the treatment facility, uh, I was supervising the, uh, another international in in intensive care physician who was embedded in the regional hospital to help provide that technical support, provide con continuity daily rounds uh, to their uh, 35 bed uh, ICU and their 10 bed intermediate care unit. Uh, this definitely couldn't have been done without a full medical team. So we had physicians, we had nurses, both international and national that were uh, involved in all levels of this project. Uh, and then at the treatment uh, and isolation facility, we had a team of health promoters that would really provide psychosocial support help us communicate with patient families um, and to also provide some patient education around long COVID, COVID recovery and um, health and nutrition to help decrease burden of other chronic, of chronic diseases. Uh, at the tail end of this project, I was lucky to be able to help uh, start a new branch in Cusco where we provided, again, technical support to an intermediate and uh, intensive care facility uh, in that city. Next, next slide. So I think, uh, two of the biggest challenges that um, I faced as a USA trained physician working in these contexts. Uh, one was, of course, in some of these universal challenges that we see in COVID. The discrepancies between local practice, national, international clinical pro protocols, varying levels of physician and nurse experience, both with COVID, but also with basic emergency care and critical care and in, in hospital care. The entire logistical aspect of ensuring a good supply of electricity and oxygen, as well as key medications and protective equipment. 
and safe admission and referral of patients, both between facilities uh, when they needed, they exceeded the level of care that was available at our facilities, or uh, when patients were in the community looking for, to be admitted, uh, where would be the first best place for them to go. And throughout this whole process, remaining responsive to our Ministry of Health and Community Partners, whether that was helping organize a vaccine awareness campaign, uh, figuring out how to get our own staff vaccinated through the MOH system, uh, and uh, always revisiting the admission and referral uh, pathways and outcomes of the patients. Um, in, in general, MSF, in many MSF contexts and projects, there are very clear protocols uh, established, whether it's trauma care, pediatric care. And sometimes as international, as physicians trained in the USA, working in a, a different context, it can feel uh, difficult or, or foreign to be working with uh, protocols that we may not be familiar with, or maybe at a lower level of, of, of care. Uh, in terms of technical um, equipment and medications and, and nursing support available. Um, so one example is so, uh, fluids for resuscitation of pediatric patients. Um, you know, different physicians from different contexts had different practices. And, and so in order to harmonize that um, and to really unify the care that we're giving to the patients, but they, they also the care uh, that's given by the team. For, uh, for example, in Sierra Leone, my first, or actually in all of my projects, um, with the exception of Brazil, I've never worked with another USA trained physician. I've always been working with other uh, physicians trained in other international contexts. And we are often working day in, day out uh, with a large local team of physicians or non clinician physicians or advanced practice providers. And having this uh, unified set of protocols is really important, both for continuity of care of the patients but also for communication within and outside of the team. Uh, and that successful implementation really can't be done without a good team structure and team communication between the managers, the physicians, and, and the advanced practice providers and the nursing team. Mm, I think for, especially on a first assignment, the most important uh, relationship that as a physician you're gonna have is with your direct manager, which will often be a medical activity manager or principal medical referent. Uh, he or she may be a physician, maybe a nurse, maybe a public health specialist. Um, and so going from sort of the MSF protocols, the project strategy, and working together and have, having very clear lines of communication and, and um, objectives is really crucial to having um, a good functioning project and a responsive team to your needs and the needs of your patients. So with that, um, I'll be happy to answer questions in the general session. and. Um, thanks for listening. All right, thank you, Mike. Um, we'll move to Mahati. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here today. Uh, I'm really thrilled to see everyone in this group um, interested in global health. You know, I'm just, uh, I'm, it shows that we're just taking more and more steps to close health discrepancies and coming together um, with just unity and love for the whole entire world. Um, and it's su such an honor to be in the company of people such as Michael and David and Benet, who have such great experience in this field, as well as uh, with Chelsea and Melissa, who are integral to the workings of MSF. Um, so just a little bit about my background and why I decided to join MSF. Um, I'm a PEM trained physician. I basically did my pediatric training at Jacoby in the Bronx, um, and then my PEM training at Emory in, uh, in Atlanta. And then I was working for a couple years at NYU Bellevue, um, and uh, I basically was working the COVID response as well. Um, it had always been a, a desire of mine to uh, work with MSF. Um, you know, my uh, my family basically have been immigrants forever and ever. Uh, we're from India, but my family used to work in Nigeria for decades, and then we came to Queens. Um, and for, for me, just from childhood, uh, seeing health discrepancies um, has just been a, a part of my reality. Um, and so, you know, as, and even during COVID, it, it became even more amplified. And so when everything um, was a little bit more calm in New York, I decided that this is the time to just go ahead and do it. I had worked in other contexts um, in Madari in Kenya. Uh, as well as in India, but these were predominantly by myself. I really had no other resources except for myself. And I basically 
ended up doing a lot more of training of personnel uh, rather than anything else. Um, a lot of the funds came from me or just uh, fundraising that I'd done um, uh, by myself. Um, and so going through MSF, the main thing that I really wanted was uh, support with resources. You know, I mean, MSF has the name. Um, you have really a pretty well-established and systemic um, organization in place uh, going Going through, I thought, you know, we'd have um, basically every kind of resource that I wanted, things like that. Those were my uh, my kind of um, ideas uh, about MSF. So I ended up applying in January of 2001. Um, I was offered uh, South Sudan for a health outreach, which I actually um, had decided on not going to. I wanted something more emerge like more hospital based and PEM focused, um, which you know you have the right to to, to say no to uh, missions, which I, I thought was interesting as well. Um, and then I ended up going to Sierra Leone in April of 2021. Um, Sierra Leone, you know, it was a very interesting project for me. It, it's not the very the most typical MSF project, as I'm told. I can't tell you otherwise, because it, it is my one and only project. I'm the newbie in the group. Um, but basically, it's in conjunction with the Ministry of Health in Sierra Leone. Um, you know, because of uh, the Ebola crisis and because of the civil war preceding it, a lot of their health, the health uh, task force in, in um, Sierra Leone had really been decimated. Uh, and MSF has been there for a good bit since the early 2000s. Um, and especially in Tonkalili, which is where I was at, uh, um, uh, it, it, we have been a presence for a while. Um, the place where I was at has kind of one of the highest infant and mater maternal mortality rates. Um, and we were there more on a capacity building uh, um, situation rather than like really an emergency task force. Um, so you know, I this actually this this picture is from uh, outside of our outside of our housing in Sierra Leone, and it's you know we were in somewhat of a rural area, but it was a pretty large catchment area, and a lot of people from around um, would come to it. So next slide, please. Uh, so I ended up going um, as a medical activity manager. It was my very first time, as I mentioned, with MSF, and I really had no idea what that meant. Um, typically, uh, they like first timers to have um, missions of about a year or so. Uh, I ended up getting away with six months. I think there was a lot of need at that point in time. Um, but basically what medical activity manager means is that uh, you are in charge of um, not just kind of not just your area of expertise, which for me was pediatrics, but kind of the whole entire hospital. So I was really in charge of day-to-day -day processes of uh, the pharmacy and of radiology, of lab, um, of the clinics, uh, things like that, and as well as like how everyone in the hospital was interacting with each other. Um, this ended up being a lot of work. When I got there, I was the first pediatrician, but I was the only pediatrician that was on the ward. Some of the challenges in working with Ministry of Health were um, that, you know, people <laughs> might or might not show up to work. Um, and so when I went, I was told that there were going to be maybe one or two other physicians there in the pediatric department that were from Ministry of Health. And when I ended up going there, there, there pretty much was only me. Um, the good thing about MSF is when I requested for backup, I, they, I was sent another pediatrician, which was really wonderful. Um, we had a malaria surge, kind of numbers that we hadn't seen in a really, really long time. Um, and so uh, we, um, you know, the extra help was very welcome. So again, to, to emphasize the, the thing that about MSF that was really important to me was resources. And when I needed more help, they would send me more help. And not always the case, of course, and especially during COVID, that's not always the case. Um, but I was very happy with that. Can you go on to the next slide, please? Part of our uh, part uh, part of my mission over there also was to um, open a UNICEF-run NICU or a UNICEF a NICU in corroboration in collaboration with UNICEF. 
Um, so this was kind of our brand new ward. Uh, in addition, we opened up two new PICUs um, and we, uh, we um, essentially expanded the pediatric ER. The pediatric ER when we got there was uh, the size of a hallway and they were running pretty serious cases, you know, traumas and um, very, very, very serious, like near death malarias, things like that within that, within that small little tiny hallway. Um, so the expansion of the ER was pretty big as well. So can you go on to the next slide, please? Uh, the main thing that I thought was very important and the main thing that MSF also emphasized was that uh, training um, of personnel over there is really important. Over here, we are just uh, looking at nebulizers um, and how to give albuterol nebulizers. This also, I thought this slide, this picture was really interesting because um, we're giving training and a lot of capacity building and a lot of um, being in places where MSF exists for a long time uh, brings up questions of what our role is in MSF as well. This nebulizer to me represents that <laughs> because uh, we're giving training on these nebulizers. However, um, we didn't have liquid albuterol. Um, that was that, you know, we probably had like two vials of that. Uh, as well as you know the the tubing and the masks and everything ran out super quickly. So um, it, it comes with its complications. However, everyone was super eager to learn. Um, and you know, in the future, uh, when things are more resourceful, I felt like this would be helpful to them. Next slide, please. So this is basically in a little clinic. Uh, we did a little bit of health outreach as well. So going to more of the rural areas. Um, and this is just showing the catchment areas uh, of, the, of this rural clinic, um, as well as they started tracking their own um, uh, malaria rates and immunization rates and everything like that, which again is um, part of uh, uh, capacity building with MSF. So next slide, please. Uh, this is my really messy desk. <laughs> um, there's a lot of paperwork involved, uh, clearly. Um, but, you know, ag again, uh, this being a weird project, um, uh, the, you know, we're trying to keep track of death rates and we're trying to keep track of uh, um, just patterns and things like that. So this is, yeah, this was essentially a part of your responsibility. So. Next slide, please. So, um, I mean, going there, I, I think uh, I was really nervous as to what my living situation would be. Um, and I think various uh, um, projects have various living situations. Uh, Sierra Leone is not a high security context. And also, as I said, you know, MSF has been there for a while. So there are brick and mortar buildings. This was my room with a mosquito net. Um, this was in Freetown, but mine in Magbaraka, where, uh, which was where my project was, was very similar. Uh, you know, we didn't have hot water, um, but besides that, I feel like we had, and we didn't have AC, but besides that, we, we had essential creature comforts. Um, however, people in, you know, South Sudan being like the main one that I always heard about, uh, um, where people like lived in tents and it was hot and they didn't necessarily have all, have all the facilities, it, it's different for each project. Um, the main thing about being in the field is that, you know, whoever is in your team is going to be, become your family that comes with, uh, you know, the complications of existing with other adults. Um, and I think, you know, people become your best friends and people are also, uh, are also, you know, it, it can be complicated. However, you, you're working towards a goal and you have to deal with that as adults. So. Next slide, please. I don't know if you could, I don't know if you could see that, but it's supposed to be a picture of uh, the other pediatrician in the field um, who, yeah, there she is, who celebrated her 31st birthday over there. Um, Sophia, that's her name. Um, but basically, you know, I put this on there because I think one of the biggest challenges for me uh, existing in Sierra Leone and also being a medical uh, activity manager and also having uh, an MSF team that ended up being mostly female, um, working in the context of uh, 
yeah, of a joint MOH program um, was that uh, having the power, uh, you know, having like being in a position of power with everyone else being male and of that country become became somewhat complicated. Um, and I think, again, we have to be, you know, we have to uh, be culturally sensitive, but also um, be strong as women. I think that was something that um, was, uh, that took me a little while of uh, understanding, um, but things that you think are correct, uh, you know, you have to stand your ground for. Um, yeah, I, I think also um, a couple of times I had to actually go and approach uh, the men who are in leadership roles at the at the hospital and just be like, hey, you know, this we're working together for this, you know, like we have to, you have to understand what I'm saying. I'm understanding what you're saying. Let's come together for a common goal. Um, but I will say that it, it just voice being your own voice, like as a female can be complicated sometimes um, in different cultural contexts. Uh, just in terms of security, though, I felt that, um, you know, I, I, I didn't feel uh, insecure as like being a female in this specific situation. Um, I do think like even internally in MSF, there were some complications with being females and having and with being a female and having my superiors being males. Um, I think that the excellent thing about MSF was that when I had issues or complaints, I had people that I could go to. Uh, and, the, and my complaints were really pretty well heard. Um, so I thought that was really excellent. So next slide, please. Um, I mean, I think my takeaways uh, from this are that uh, every, you, every mission is very individual. I've talked to other people about my experience who have done this many, many times before me. Um, and that's what they say to me all the time. You know, this is this is one experience you, you know, and I, I am so happy that I did it. I feel like, um, uh, you know, I, I always am questioning whether or not um, what we leave behind is as important as what is left to, or what we take away from it. Um, and I definitely took away so, so much, um, but uh, you know, every, every uh, project is individual. Um, and I'm definitely, you know, for me, this is one mission, but I'm, I'm and I'm planning on going back to NYU Bellevue as faculty, um, but I am also planning on continuing with MSF in the future. Thank you, Mahati. Um, so our next panelist will be David. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me? Perfect. All right. Hey, um, it's, uh, yeah, as the other speakers have said, it's a real pleasure to speak to you guys here. I'm actually calling in from Amsterdam, where I live now. Um, so it's the, the evening here. And um, yeah, I want to just take you through a couple of, of my experiences um, with MSF over the last few years. I joined in 2015, so I've been around for a few years. And now actually I, I work full time here in Amsterdam in the Dutch headquarters. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. Um, there's just a couple of my kind of background bio um, uh, information there. And, um, you know, I, I would say during med school and during residency, I was extremely tied in and targeted at, at a career in global health. Um, and, and then, so when I came out in 2015 and you can jump to the next slide, uh, when I came out in 2015, I was really, you know, not looking around for a job. All the, all of my colleagues were looking for, um, you know, uh, academic community jobs, the kind of standard thing in emergency medicine. And I, I would applied straight away for MSF at that time. Um, and since then I've been, uh, running around quite a bit. I did several missions over those um, four or five years. And then uh, in 2020, I moved here to Amsterdam and I've been um, uh, since now working as a health advisor. Um, you know, some of, some of the highlights of that, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna just take through you guys through a couple, a couple uh, pictures in the next slides, but um, I, I really have been in, um, uh, in Bangladesh uh, several times dealing with the Rohingya. So I'll talk about that. And then um, moving through, I would say also um, some of the, from, from a frontline clinician up to some of more senior management positions. Uh, and so, you know, I'm really happy to kind of answer some of the questions about that too, as you, as, as we come into the Q and A. I think for me, I, for a long time, uh, you know, already since a decade or more, I was really focused on a, on a career in global health and, a, and 
and and building, you know, kind of into some of the, into the essentially into the management type position that I'm in now. And so some of my experiences early on as as a frontline clinician sort of fed in, into into some of the next experiences that I started to take on as a manager. What's most interesting though is some of the experiences like in the in the front lines. And I want to just show you guys briefly a couple pictures. So I was in 2015 in, in Bangladesh in the southern part, and I went back in 2017. And then actually the last two several years I've been a health advisor for Bangladesh. So I've got a lot of deep connections, I would say, to the Rohingya crisis there. And that uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, that um, the crisis has been going on for a long time. And a lot of what we do as MSF is deal with um, the kind of the dark, you know, the, the phrase we often use is people on the move, but this is really refugees and IDPs. And uh, I went in as part of the emergency team in 2017, as almost 800,000 uh, Rohingya came across the border from, from uh, the Western part of Myanmar and uh, really moving after sustaining what has been termed, uh, you know, a genocide against them, moving across wet rice paddies, flooding, um, you know, you can see the conditions there. And so um, I was uh, on a border crossing medical team there um, for about a month in, in 2017, as these people were coming across, you can go to the next one. And so one of the things we were doing out there was moving around, um, doing essentially triage for people. So um, that lady on the right there and that photo is that the older woman holding the baby, she is the, the grandmother of that little, that little infant. And the mother is down there. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the lady in the yellow is the grandmother. And that, that, um, that lady who's very sick appearing there basically was having postpartum sepsis. And so we, they grabbed us and found us and we kind of marched out into this muddy rice paddy, found her and were able to bring her back to the stabilization unit we were running on the, on the side of the um, border there. This is kind of in the no man's land between the two countries. Um, and, you know, she actually just delivered that baby well on, well en route, you know, as a refugee coming across the border. So that's the kind of it was very practical direct intervention that we were able to have. Um, you can go to the next slide. This is kind of the conditions that people were arriving in. Um, and honestly, one of the most like horrible situations that I've ever seen people in in, in quite a lot of different spots. Um, go ahead to the next one. So you know another um, component of what we were doing out there was really, infrastructure building right and and you know michael described setting up some covid wards this is this was quite similar a lot of my job was yeah okay as a frontline physician and seeing patients and and being active clinically but also working to to set up new facilities and being part of that organizational team and so um if you just kind of slowly go through the next few slides you'll see this hospital then then here it gets built and everything gets uh, brought in. And um, this is, you know, a, an emergency order that comes in. And then if you go to the next one, you see now another week later, uh, go, why don't you go back one, uh, a week later, that hospital is basically ready to, to almost receive patients, right? Everything's been distributed. We've set up the pharmacy. We've set up all of these, these different things. And that is, uh, you know, about a month's work by a huge team um, in the background uh, we're training new doctors training nurses and really being ready to receive patients which you'll see on the next slide was our small emergency room and I think this was the first day that we we saw patients there um, and they start to be admitted and, and and essentially this expands the healthcare access into that camp <clears throat> you can keep going through the next slides um, that's that hospital. And that MSF ended up running about five or six hospitals across that camp, in addition to many, many other NGOs as well. Go ahead. A lot of what you do as a, um, as a international staff in these places is not just seeing um, patients, right? Because there's a, actually a large team responsible. And, and I don't speak Rohingya or Bangla. You know, my, my role there was really as in some ways I think of it as like an attending in, you know in the states in our in our hospitals is to, to was to be guiding a lot of the clinical care and decision making bringing some of the technical experience that I had as you know an emergency trained physician 
but then doing a lot of trainings uh, and, and trying to bring that across. And so those are just some examples of that as well. Uh, why don't you blast ahead here? Good. A um, lot of things we've we've doing in that camp and there's big teams. So uh, there was a big diphtheria outbreak in that camp um, shortly after the arrival of all those people in late uh, 2017, 2018. So we had to respond to that. And uh, anybody who worked there will have probably the world's most experience ever with diphtheria because it's just not something we see very often, except in a huge group of people that just haven't been vaccinated. Go ahead. Good. Lots of um, water, sanitation, latrines, this kind of things. And then you can go ahead. And lots of outreach, you know, moving around in the camp with teams, trying to reach people uh, where they're at. So that's that's the first one. And then I'll, I'll move also quickly through this. Uh, in 2018, I, I had the absolute pleasure to work as, a, as the doctor on board this ship. And um, this is, again, this was very much focused on, uh, on refugees and people on the move. And this is focused on search and rescue in the Mediterranean. I'm sure a lot of you have seen that over the years in the news. And um, there are several iterations of that ship that have existed. MSF is still running search and rescue under uh, on a new ship now, but this was the Aquarius. You can go ahead. And uh, we would encounter rafts full of people out at sea um, and then send out uh, small rescue boats. You can keep moving forward. Let's see if that comes through. Yeah, good. Um, oh, maybe go back, maybe one slide. Yeah, so we would send out rescue boats and we would essentially bring people on to the ship. And one of the most interesting components of that was being, being a medic. And, and I was standing just right where this photo was taken, essentially doing triage for several hundred people as they come across, right? And you, you know, we talk about in emergency medicine a lot, the sick or not sick kind of feeling that you get. And everybody knows that I think on the call. And this was, this was doing that at, you know, at scale for, for, you know, hundred people as they're coming through. And it's really all about eye contact trying to decide, you know, everybody's exhausted, everybody's sun exposed and, and dehydrated, but trying to decide who was more ill than that was uh, fascinating clinically. And, and you really, I mean, you also saw the just an incredible emotion and, and hope that was going through the eyes of the, the, the people we had brought on, on the ship that, who had been rescued. So really um, fascinating place to work. I think there's one or two slides and we can kind of punch through them here and, just to show you what it looks like, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up for leave it to the questions. Um, that is our little inpatient uh, or our little clinic space on that ship. You know, so we had quite a bit of things. We had the capability to, to intubate. We had ultrasound, um, and uh, you know, it was uh, really almost almost anything we could uh, need to do there. We we could do, except of course, occasionally there was the need to maybe evacuate somebody from the ship, and that also occurred. Um, I'll maybe I'll say one last thing, uh, and then I'll, I'll I'll stop and hand it over to our HR uh, team from MSF. But you know, I think I've been now doing MSF missions for the last um, I think yeah seven I was almost five seven six seven years, and now based in Ham in uh, Amsterdam, working full time for MSF, and uh, you know it's just honestly an absolute pleasure. It, it, this has been one of the most interesting and fulfilling kind of uh, parts of my career so far. And um, the, 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 the work that you get to do, the travel, all of that is fascinating. But then I think even more importantly, you know, the, the, the chance to interact with our patients, with our national staff all over the world, um, to be present and part of Part of the work that MSF is doing globally has just been uh, honestly the highlight of my life. And, and so, you know, I, if you're thinking about this direction as a career or as an experience, I, I can't recommend it enough. It, it's just really great. There's lots of details there. There's lots of things to chat about, but, um, and how to do that. Um, but um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks a lot. Thanks, David. Uh, we will finally turn to Chelsea and Melissa, who 
we'll talk a little bit about the application process, um, some details about MSF that I think there've already been questions in the chat. Great, again, I just wanna thank um, all of our MSF team and then also Vinay for putting this together. It's really an honor to be here. Um, so my name is Melissa, um, she, her, she and her pro pronouns. I was a logistician in the field. I've been with the organization since 2009, but now in an HR capacity. So um, I know there's a lot of questions about how do you make this work and what kind of benefits does MSF offers. So I think what, what Chelsea and I will do is really talk more about the process and then open it up um, for questions because I think you probably want pointed questions more to the medical professionals. But um, so basically this application process, um, it is competitive, um, just in the sense that uh, we have, um, we want to send professionals to, um, to work with us um, in all capacities. And then hopefully like David, um, we want people to definitely grow into these leadership positions at the organization. So that was pretty inspirational. So it kind of gave you a big idea of how you could potentially work long-term with MSF. Um, but basically we require, um, we want you to have completed residency and ideally have two years of professional experience under your belt. Um, before you apply, just because we want to, again, um, have you really be an independent practitioner um, before you go with us. Um, we do have information sessions like today, um, and then there's an online application. We have a phone call with you. We do an interview, and then you have briefings, um, and then you're into the pool of candidates. So we don't have people apply for specific positions. It's really applying for this pool of candidates to be able to go wherever the needs are. Um, next slide. So one of the things um, is, uh, so people have put in the chat, like what are some of the requirements or language needs? Definitely French. So if you have any French capacity or you can work on your French, I would highly recommend it. As um, in our five largest projects, um, two of them are French speaking contexts. So um, we have certain positions which we are open specifically to new people within the organization. And, um, and of those 60% are in French speaking context. So French is definitely a great language to know if you wanna work with us. Um, and also Spanish, Arabic um, and Portuguese, um, but definitely French helps you get to the field faster. Um, next slide. So what benefits do we provide? Um, so you do get paid a small uh, salary when you're in the field with us. So it's $2,039 per month. Um, and that increases with experience. We pay for all your transportation, work permits, visas, um, all of those things. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, we provide health, dental, and vision insurance for the entire time you're in the, um, in the country working with us. And then for three months after you return, and then access to a 401k plan. And then um, we have medical um, malpractice insurance, additional emergency coverage. So like, let's say you needed a medevac or something like that, we have that. You do get vacation days. So 25 days for every 12 months um, in the field or working with us. And then that's prorated depending on the length of your assignment. Um, and then we, are, uh, we qualify for a public service organization. We do ask for um, nine to 12 month commitment, um, but that doesn't always mean that you will be sent to the uh, field for nine to 12 months. You may get us a shorter assignment. And then someone had a question about family. So unfortunately, because of the places that we work, um, it is really hard to bring a family um, to any of the locations. So oftentimes um, when people do have families with MSF, it's when they've moved into um, higher level positions, such as like medical coordinator in a, in a fairly stable context. Um, but as we know, the context change rapidly. So we don't uh, have like a family, um, family assignments, which I know other organizations do. Um, so I, that was just super quick. So, cause I wanna give much time for questions, but then if you have additional questions, if you can just go to the next slide. Chelsea and I can answer any of those. Our, my other colleague, Rohir Van Helman, um, we put our just our emails there. Please feel free to reach out, ask a lot of questions, really decide if this is um, the right organization and the right time, um, because we do um, really value everyone who works for us, but we also want to make sure that you feel comfortable um, and have all your questions answered before you do apply. So 
I'm going to hand it back to Vinay, I guess. Thanks so much, Melissa. So we have a lot of great questions in the chat. Um, and then there's also some other questions that we've kind of um, started to think about as panelists ourselves. Um, so there were a lot of specific questions kind of more geared towards Melissa and Chelsea, and I think um, that are more logistical that I wrote down. I think you talked a little bit about how long missions are, the languages that are really assets, how what the application process is. Uh, I think there was just another question about the timeline and um, what people should expect in terms of how soon they would get a response and also um, how how early they should apply in anticipation of actually going into the field. Great, so I would say to apply four to five months before you're ready. Um, this way we can go through the whole application process, you can be onboarded. Um, and then depending on the needs, so like Michael had said earlier, um, you know, it, it can be a wait or it can happen right away. It really depends on, you know, so you can imagine um, we sent a lot of people really experienced to Ukraine current, you know, are currently there, but then we know as this progresses, progresses, there's going to be additional needs, you know, teams are going to be tired, people we're going to have to send. Um, so it really depends on the context. Like in COVID, we really needed P ICU physicians. Um, so, but I would say our goal is after you complete that onboarding course to get you to the field within six months after that onboarding course. So I would apply four to six months before you're ready. And then with the idea that hopefully you'll be placed within four to six months after that um, onboarding. And Melissa, Tanya just asked another question. If there's any sort of match program for physician couples. I don't have anything like that. I'm sorry. But it's something to think about. We'll take a note and we can, you know, MSF is always changing and trying to uh, think of think differently and strategically. Um, but we can just take the feedback um, and see if any time in the future that would be something. But currently we don't have anything. And then I think one other question, I know most of, I mean, all of our panelists are physicians, but I want to be acknowledge the fact that there might be non-physicians in the, in the group. What other skill sets do you recruit for? Yeah, so like I did logistics, um, so logisticians, financial administrators, HR professionals, epidemiologists, nurses, um, health promoters, Chelsea, help me if I'm, I'm forgetting, psychologists, mental health providers, lab technicians. HR? Yeah. HR. Yeah, so I would say it's like the medical professionals, so, you know, nurses, physicians, surgeons, like in that bucket, and then all of the people that support those activities. So then it's the logistics or the financial administrators, HR professionals. And then of course, like I said, EPIs, health promoters. And, and pharmacists, right? Oh, pharmacists, thank you. <laughs> um, and then there was another question um, that Anam asked and basically um, it, there was a, there's a question about what kind of skills uh, would be you know, assets, um, in addition to language skills, what kind of skills would be assets, particularly for um, those who are still in training and haven't had the two years of experience post-residency? So so I'm going to actually ask Michael and, no. yeah, um, because, I mean, I can tell you what I think, but but also from practical ex, uh, experience, of course, more broad, a generalist background is much more applicable for us rather than a hyper-specialized um, person, someone who's flexible, adaptable, but go ahead. Any other panelists want to jump in? I can jump in. I'll say something there. Um, hey, I, I think that, I mean, uh, um, other skills are that are very useful, certainly generalist, but I think that it's, if you want, if you want to join MSF, it's worth at some point spending a bit of time on public health. Uh, it's also very useful to have done a bit of tropical medicine, right? And you have to figure out along the way where to get that. I think in residency, in med school and in residency, it's actually a perfect opportunity to build some of that experience through electives, right? You know, so you try to figure out how you can do overseas electives. And then of course, if you're in a fellowship um, that's geared toward global health, that that's also going to build that expertise and experience. Um, and then I, I would say uh, one other thing about the French. I think that French is super useful. And so if you can, and it, 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 you can join MSF without speaking French, you, you certainly can. But if you can add that to your quiver, um, you will get a lot more opportunity um, because 
we're basically always short on French speaking uh, international staff, right? And so if you can come in and with some, some amount of French, it's, it's very useful um, because there's just lots of open positions typically. And Melissa, I think you may have addressed this, but is there a standard for competency? Do you expect like a B1 on, on the European kind of grading yeah, system? B, B1 is the minimum. But if, like David said, if you're like an A1, A2, we're thinking about ways that we can help get people up to the B1 level. But if you can't, yeah, it doesn't have to be fluency in French or Parisian French, uh, you know, C2, like it can be, it can be basic French um, and we can help you also get there. Through intensive courses and through um, things like that. So MSF helped me with several weeks of intensive French at one point. Um, so yeah, there's definitely options there, but building the, the bit of the base is, is super useful. And if you've got a couple year horizon, that uh, it's a great thing to add. And another kind of logistical question, also kind of lifestyle question that is open to the entire panel. Um, how many of your deployed on mission physicians are parents? Do you see that most individuals are deploying either prior to parenting responsibilities or after children are out of the home? Yeah, I would say definitely, unless they have some, yeah, I would say the majority of people that work with us are either don't have any kids or like later in their career or earlier in their career. But again, I've seen, you know, people do it who have kids, they just have set some something up. Um, it's just to be really cognizant about um, what that will be like to be away from your children for six to nine months um, and really think thoughtfully about how you would process that. And we also have a psychosocial care support person who can help you think through some of those things um, because I don't want it to dissuade someone or say you can't work for us if you have children, of course you can. Um, but uh, for some people, we've had some instances where they kind of didn't think thoughtfully enough about how it would impact their home life and then had to um, end their assignment early. But then we've also had people be really successful. Um, and another question, um, can you give a preference for a placement location? For instance, if you are from a certain country and want to go back to help your native country, is that possible? So we ask that people be really flexible in their opportunities and the placements that they go because the needs change so rapidly. And also it's just benefiting the patient population that we serve, that we have the flexibility. Um, of course, we're gonna take some of those things into consideration if you have knowledge or you have skills that are applicable for that um, location, but we ask people to be really open to going wherever the needs are. And then another kind of logistical question, even if MSF doesn't arrange logistics, could you travel with your family in the event you're working in a stable host country? So that's all case by case um, discussion. So I would just ask that person maybe to contact me and we can have a bigger discussion. Um, unless it's a question that came up a bunch, because sometimes that's really, really specific. And then I think uh, this is a question that can be open to, to the entire panel of uh, physicians. So this came up in the chat, but also this is something that I think is probably on, on the forefront of a lot of people's thoughts is, is really how to balance your MSF life with your life back in your non-MSF role. And it sounds like from the three of you, you actually kind of all approached it in three very specific and different ways. Um, so I would love for you to kind of comment on, on that. Uh, and in particular, some of the folks in the audience might be interested in a career in a more academic setting. And um, if you can talk a little bit about what that might look like. I mean, I can, I can start. Um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, for me, um, kind of being open with your uh, um, host academic center is pretty important. Um, you know, like for me, I, um, I left, but I was like, I'm going to come back, you know, and I will work for you guys, but I do want to be with MSF um, in the future. Like, this is kind of what I'm looking like, what my career, uh, my career path to be like, can you guys accommodate that? Um, and, you know, they're either going to say yes or they're either going to say no, but, you know, at least the discussion is open. Um, there is uh, another um, doctor in our, in our university system who is absolutely amazing. She's a pediatrician working in the pediatric ER who's been with MSF forever and ever. And she actually ended up taking the job with NYU um, and started off just being like, hey, I need this much time uh, away because this is the, these are my actual like life interests. Um, and, you know, they gave it to her. So again, I think like being really open with your 
um, academic institution about what you want and what your career goals, uh, um, you know, should look like in the future is really important. Maybe I'll just jump in. Uh, I think that's really that's really very true. You have to you have to be very transparent with people, and I think you also have to figure out what you want, right? So this this really gets into the kind of broader topic of how you design a, a life in global health, right? And that's that's MSF for sure, but it's just a big topic that anybody who wants to do international work um, has to figure out, right? And um, and you have to balance that against all of the things that you want, right? Family and kids and time in the States working and in what setting uh, and, and time overseas and how to do that. Uh, for MSF in particular, I think that you you have you know these these kind of uh, obligations of a, a initial an initial longer mission, and that that's a that's a clear right. You know you you have to be willing to be flexible and and have um, you know this nine month twelve month commitment up front. I would say that after that, it does become a lot more flexible. Um, and there are ways that once you're kind of inside the system, you can build in a bit more of intentional balance. Um, and, and you have to figure out that, uh, kind of as you go. Right. And so for me, for the first, I, I went off and I did a nine month mission. That was my first mission in 2015. And then I came back from that and I worked locums, right. I worked in several different spots around Massachusetts and I was in Indiana for a bit. And then after a couple of missions, I actually started wanting a home base. And so I was actually on the, um, I hired at USC in California and LA for three years. And I had arranged with them a contract where I was just paid for six months per year. And so I did that for three years. Uh, it was great. It was, it was a lovely arrangement. It was in an academic center. I could do all, all of the EM things in a big county hospital that we all know and love. And then I could take off for six months per year. After three years of that, uh, you know, the lifestyle of moving here and moving there for six months, uh, you know, every six months caught up to me a bit. And I, and I decided to make a jump to, to this job in Amsterdam, where now I'm um, essentially working here full time. But on this, on this end, I took, uh, you know, I negotiated and uh, I have about six weeks off per year from this end to go back to the States. And I'm doing clinical work, uh, mostly through locums. And so, you know, like I, I, I want both. I still want to be doing doing EM back home, and I, but I also now in this part of my career want to be focused on the public health uh, MSF side. So you you kind of find your way. You figure out how to balance it against the the, the things that are important to you at certain times in life, and then, um, yeah. And I think each person's pathway is a bit different, to be honest, in that in that track. So, yeah, that's all. So I was really lucky uh, in that my home institution here at Houston, it has a locums position for private moonlighters in the academic facility. And so I actually moved into that status for the last four years. Um, so instead of having six months on, six months off, I'm basically an at-will uh, uh, physician. So when I'm available for either place, I work at either place. Uh, I take the time off that I need to recover. Uh, and then I go back and work in the other place. Um, so. But at, at the same time, over the last four years, that has definitely caught up to me as well. Uh, and so my plan for now is to, to be based in the USA for the next couple of years at least. And, and again, just like David said, to reassess where I am in my life and what I want to do and how I want to balance my time. Um, we mentioned about loan forgiveness and MSF being a public, uh, qualified public service organization. Of course, finances is going to, be an, uh, is going to have implications on any decision that anyone makes. For me, I was really lucky in that I had institutional programs available to help with uh, loan forgiveness and public service forgiveness for my medical school. Um, and so that was the, one of the things that made it possible for me to, to accept, to, to make this arrangement that I have right now. Uh, I wanted to circle back real quick on one other um, considered opportun uh, opportunity or experience before applying to MSF. And that is working in remote access hospitals and rural hospitals in the USA or other high income settings. Um, often we are in MSF settings, you are going to be working in a center that will be sort of that origin referral center or that referring center. And so having experience in that rural place, whether as part of a locums group 
or as uh, or working in the Indian Health Service. Uh, it's a very common position for um, MSF physicians um, or in other remote access hospitals that can be a key clinical experience in addition to having that communication and managerial experience. So working in a small hospital where you have a very direct relationship with your nurse managers, with your medical director, and understanding what are the barriers to care or implementing care, that's super important to, to, to know uh, working in MSF context or MSF projects. Uh, and that might be something that we might not have gotten exposure to training in a large academic center and residency or working in a large urban uh, emergency department or health system. Thanks, Michael. Oh, Vivi, uh, just, a, just a quick shout. I forgot to have Chelsea introduce herself. I just like went into my spiel. So, um, <laughs> Chelsea, no, that's back. okay. Um, so I don't need to go into a big formal introduction, but yes. So I'm Chelsea. I work as the recruitment outreach coordinator. Um, so I just wanted to chime in on the question because I think something that we're working on as a team is more to develop the DEI competency and how we evaluate applicants. So I think just tying into some of the other things that others have said, um, I think it's really important to have worked within a cultural setting that is not your own. Um, so that doesn't need to be international, that can be domestic, that can be in a low resource setting in the United States. But I think increasingly, and really it's very central to our culture, we strive to be a very inclusive and very aware employer. And I think we wanna try and push that further in our field settings as well. So we're really looking for applicants that can display some cultural awareness and adap adaptation. Um, you don't have to have lived abroad. You don't have to have backpacked around Europe. Uh, you know, it's more about displaying this, this adaptability and awareness and ability to self-reflect. Um, also being in the medical profession, being aware of the biases that you may bring to another setting and really being able to speak on your um, awareness of that and your experience with um, challenging that in your own setting. So I don't know, Missy, if you have anything to add, but of course, anyone can ask questions too. If oh, you that was know. perfect. Thank you for adding. And, and Chelsea, uh, thank you for kind of touching on that. Um, and also thank you for diligently answering all the questions in the chat room as this, uh, the last hour has been kind of going on. But kind of to piggyback off that, I think, you know, there has been, I think for, for folks who've been involved in global health, um, and humanitarian health in particular, we, we know that there's been a long overdue reckoning of decolonization and anti-racism um, that kind of goes beyond just uh, DEI, but, it, but um, really piggybacks off the idea of DEI. Uh, but there's been this long overdue reckoning of, of decolonization and anti-racism within global health institutions, the humanitarian aid sector. And this is obviously something that is continuing, this is not a static process. Um, so from your experience, and this is open to Chelsea and Melissa, uh, Ch Chelsea and Melissa from an HR perspective, and also David from a more kind of historical institutional perspective, and also Mahati and Michael, um, how has MSF taken some meaningful steps to apply a decolonial approach to its work? I can definitely just start from uh, working in the office and uh, from a more HR perspective. So as Chelsea said, we're working hard to, especially from the recruitment perspective, to make sure that we're recruiting the best possible candidates. And then also that people who have um, uh, acknowledge, not only acknowledged, but are trying to improve practices within their own systems. Um, I would say like in full transparency and, transparency and honesty, MSF is, um, as we're a global organization, really Chelsea and I can impact the U.S. applicants and then try to um, try to spread that uh, throughout the organization. But it is a challenge for us, and I think it's something that we're reckoning with. So some of the things that I think we're doing is um, uh, one is making sure that everybody has some basis. Well, I mean, we can go into basic knowledge of what the um, historical contexts are for international humanitarian um, aid, also ensuring that people have equity in um, their pay and the structure and also the opportunities, because I think historically that hasn't been the case, um, just in all transparency. And then also, so there's different working groups, there's different things that are happening across the entire organization um, that are trying to address it, but I think most of us wish it was happening faster than it is. Michael? Uh, I think I wanted to add a perspective from on the ground in that um, it's tough. It's um, 
as a humanitarian organization coming into an emergency space, um, often it seems like things um, get struck, they get, get brought in in sort of the MSF way. Um, and that's the clinical practice, but that's also the organizational structure in, in some ways too. And so there's always challenges with that. But I would say there is a change uh, overall in that um, it is a huge international movement. And there are people from the global north, global south who are all internationally mobile. So I would say in my last three assignments, my direct manager has been someone that has been a national staff before um, and then became an internationally mobile staff. So in Malawi, that was a Malawian physician, public health, who had worked in Uganda and Kenya and then uh, worked in Malawi as my medical uh, manager for the project. Um, in the Palestinian project, it was a Jordanian uh, nurse who came up in the, uh, who trained in the, the plastic reconstructive surgery project there became basically the medical director or the highest medical position in that project and then came over uh, into the occupied Palestinian territories to run our project. And in Peru, working with an outreach nurse that had worked in Angola, Mozambique, uh, and had run projects in, in her home country of Peru as well. Um, so really, it's not just international from the traditional global north or high income countries that are, are dictating decisions at the project level. It often is a cross-cultural um, management team, which is why it's so important, I think, to have that experience and awareness. Um, that said, as an organization, I think there's still, I mean, if you look at the international webpage, if you look at sort of articles that have been written, there's still a lot of power and decision making up in, in Western Europe for the organization. But I think that's something that the organization as a movement has been trying to uh, address and work towards. But again, we're talking about an uh, organization with 8,000 international staff that um, where change, unfortunately, does take time. Yeah, maybe I'll just jump in and say one or two things. I, I, I mean, maybe just to start by saying that, that there's a thousand things to say about this this topic. <laughs> there, that, you know, and there's lots of different angles on the topic. Um, one is one one that I think is extremely important is the equity um, question for for different types of staff, and that's something that is a, a constant. Michael just mentioned that a bit, and it's a constant point of discussion at, at our level here in the headquarters in Amsterdam. Um, and, you know, who fills what staff and what, why do we, why do we bring international staff across the world to, to, to fill positions and what value do all of us as international, potential international staff bring compared to physicians we can hire locally, for example. So we, we really have to think through those questions and our, and it, challenges a bit the operating model that MSF has been based on for a long time. Um, another, I think just two more briefly, another area where we're trying to figure this out more and more, and I think slowly having some success is in, in interaction with the communities and the patients that we engage with. And it's, it's less, it's more and more that we're stopping and asking communities what it is they need. Um, now we don't always get that right. And in fact, more often we probably don't, but it is it is uh, a, again, a big point of discussion. And then the last one is a bit about the power structures in, inside of MSF. And so it, I mean, this is a massive organization that has been growing and evolving over 50 years. And there's been various ways that the, the organization has, organized, has set, been set up. And right now there are five, what we call operational centers based in mostly in Western Europe, the, you know, where I sit here in Amsterdam, where are we running the direct programming? And in the last uh, few years, there is a clear move to redistribute some of where those, where those places, where those people are sitting, right? So increasingly there are um, offices in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, there's a new operational center in West Africa where they're now directly running programming and controlling decisions about finances and money and staff and, um, and several other examples. Um, so the, the organization is going through that type of self-reflection and restructuring and it's slow and it's painful and there's a thousand different arguments to have about it, but it's, but it's definitely slowly happening. And if you, if you join MSF, I think you'll start to hear that and see that. Um, so, so anyway, yeah, those are some of my thoughts. I'm just going to say one more thing as well. I mean, we talked about um, MSF as an organization uh, and responsibility to decolonize. And I think also just personally, when you are on the field uh, and a representative of MSF, 
you know, it is highly important we to actually listen to people who are on the ground and people who are locals. You know, we are a lot of times given um, things from like top down. And I think we need to start changing that a little bit more to really like bottom up, you know, like people who are on the ground have so much more experience and it is our responsibility to empower them. Um, and I think some of the ways that we did this in, in Sierra Leone were, was to um, encourage, you know, our community health officers to like form committees, you know, you guys talk amongst yourself, come, come and discuss with us because even the thought of, um, of community health officers discussing with an MSF person about their ideas uh, would be complicated. You know, power structures are complicated. So giving them the 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 freedom to talk is is highly important as well, and empowering is highly important from personal um, level. And I don't know if we have time, but do I have? Could I just add a couple of things from the recru recruitment side? Um, <clears throat> so I think just from the office level, it's important to note that. MSF USA has hired a director of DEI strategy in 2021. So that's the first time that we've had the existence of that type of role. And that's already had some major impacts. Um, and then from our department for field HR, we've introduced a DEI module for our onboarding course. So really it is becoming a requirement and a competency for all new staff that are brought into the organization that they have this competency and can display those qualities as a potential applicant coming into the organization. So we've made a conscious effort, definitely in our recruitment. I would say also from my standpoint in outreach to really go out and find who is underrepresented within each individual profile and pool. So in our med pool, we look at who are the underrepresented groups, and then we focus all of our outreach efforts on targeting those specific groups um, around the field needs. So really, we've had a lot of success in trying to diversify our pool, but of course, diversifying staff is only uh, the beginning of really how we tackle DEI at MSF. So I just wanted to speak from that perspective. And, you know, when we recruit people, the narrative used to be more of an adventure seeking narrative. Um, are you MSF? And I think rather than that, we're really trying to offer something to people. Is MSF the right fit for your professional goals? And are we the right employer for you? So approaching recruitment from the angle of being transparent up front and really giving people all the information that they need to decide whether MSF is right for them. Thank you for all, for all of your inputs. I, I think, you know, some of, this is obviously an ongoing conversation to think about how we're actually meaningfully tackling anti-racism efforts and decolonization within the global health space. I think Mahati, you kind of talked about really in, being inclusive and what does inclusion actually mean? At, at the local level, and then Melissa and Chelsea talking about what inclusion means sort of at the uh, organizational recruitment level is, is also very important. Um, I, we have just a couple more minutes. Um, the last kind of uh, topic that we wanted to just briefly touch on that I think Mahati has touched on and a couple other people have as well is just really um, the security concerns, which I think is maybe a little bit of an elephant in the room, but we want to just talk a little bit about um, how to approach security concerns, insecurity, and how that impacts your, your life in the field. So um, I can just start from, um, so MSF takes security very seriously, but again, um, we are not immune to, um, to security instances happening, or are we immune to things that have where MSF has been targeted. Um, but I would say one of the ways that we ensure our security is through um, negotiation and discussion, and then of course, quality medical care. So when we're negotiating safe space or negotiating medical activity space, we're going to have those discussions to ensure, um, like I'll just give a specific example, like in Afghanistan, the Taliban and the US forces knew the coordinates of our hospital, yet it was still, um, you know, uh, was still targeted. So, um, so just to say that uh, we, so one is if you ever feel safe, you can always go home, no questions asked. Before you uh, take an assignment, you get a security, um, you should get a security briefing, or if you have additional questions about the security set, set, setting, you are, of course, uh, can talk to anyone um, and then make an informed decision. Um, we also have a duty of care, so we're a responsible employer, so we have to ensure that you are taking and the risks that you understand are the risks that you're taking, um, but you do work in a team environment, um, so often what that means is that 
Um, and we do passive security, not active security. So we don't use the armed guards. We don't have like a military presence protecting MSFs. Um, it is really about being inclusive. Um, but we do uh, do all of the things that will mitigate um, security instances. So we have what we're called watchmen or people that oversee the, the hospital and the settings where we live. We make sure that, you know, we're um, uh, when we're transporting goods or services, you know, they're making sure that the routes that we're in are secure, that we have radio communications, all of the stuff that you would need to set um, to ensure that we can be as safe as possible. I would say so then in our 40 plus years of existence, um, we have a really, really good um, track record for security and have really low instances, but every single instance that we have, we is a blow to the organization and, and we feel should have been avoided um, at all possibilities. Um, if anything were to happen, we do have a team that is mobilized just to address that. So um, if there is a security instance um, in the field, then people are removed from their day-to-day -day, um, operations and set just to um, deal with whatever um, instance that might happen. So it could be from a psychosocial care perspective um, or to, um, to a crisis management team. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers the question because each different location has different um, security protocols, but um, often that means that you're never alone. You're working, so you also have to think about, okay, what would it be like to have no personal <laughs> personal uh, freedom to move um, and to, you know, we have, people have to respect the security guidelines. And so that can feel restrictive. Like if you're a runner and you wanna go out running in the morning, but we know that, we have curfew at until seven and, and work starts at 7.30, then that might not be something that you'll, you're able to do. Um, and MSF books all of your flights and books your transportation um, because we do look at the carriers um, that we might be using. So we may avoid a certain airline or avoid a route that you think might be easier because we have security concerns of that. So um, I don't know if that answered the questions or if anybody else wants to add. Uh, I think as someone you know who goes for their first or second assignment, one one thing you quickly realize is that on every assignment there is someone responsible for your security at the project level, and there is someone responsible for your health at the project level. Um, so um, that means that there has been no matter whether you're working in a lower security or a higher security context, there is a plan that has been developed, uh, and there's a person responsible. Um, so whether that's you know. You always have either the cell phone that MSF gives you uh, on your person or you're in a, a context where you're always having a walkie talkie, um, having that communication open um, and having those rules uh, established and those protocols established. Um, uh, I've worked in mostly lower security contexts, uh, but even in those contexts, there has always been a plan because just as M Melissa mentioned, you know, part of Part of the rules are also how do we represent MSF and how do we keep our um, relationship with the community uh, in good standing, both for the work that we're doing, but also for our own, for the safety and security of the team and the staff. I'll just give one. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Lanka. The, 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 what I was going to say was I um, also have only worked in a low security context um, uh, project. So, um, it's hard for me to say about, you know, really, really unstable situations. However, I will say that um, in agreement with uh, Melissa that uh, MSF takes its security extremely, extremely seriously um, and abiding by the security protocols that have been put in place is also a highly important thing. Even if you feel like that's not that, that it's overboard or whatever, you know, it, it's been put in place for a reason. Um, and then just uh, in terms of like you being anxious of going to a place, um, one of our psychosocial people, uh, Athena, gave me wonderful advice before I left. And it was just that, you know, sometimes you might not, you know, it doesn't matter where you are. Sometimes you might have internet. Sometimes you might not have internet. And, uh, you know, in, in terms of keeping in touch with your family, just um, even setting uh, um, guidelines before you leave is important. 
you know, I might not talk to you every day, um, but, you know, like every three, four days, expect to hear from me, you know, and that gives peace of mind to both to kind of everyone involved. Yeah, I want to repeat everything everybody has said. I think that's all really well said. Uh, the only thing I just will say is that, um, look, I, I've been in some uh, unsecure locations and always felt extremely safe, right? There, there's always a chance that something happens, but I, I, MSF is an organization that takes that side of things extremely seriously and does a, does a great job. And the, the way that it does that is by good protocols, good attention to detail, but also by uh, relying on one of our core humanitarian principles of, of independent or those core principles of independence and neutrality and essentially uh, having acceptance in the in the community and in the space and so generally we are relying on that soft that soft approach to security and community acceptance rather than you know what a lot of organizations do is re revert to a kind of a harder security approach and and that and th that works really well and we're paying quite a lot of attention to that in all of our project locations. And so um, I, I think it's, you know, there's there's definitely some measure of risk assessment that you have to do for yourself, uh, but it's, but MSF is an organization that takes this stuff extremely seriously. So I would be reassured by that if that's something that's concerning you at all. Thanks. Well, thank you for everyone. Uh, in the interest of time, um, we're gonna conclude this session, but I really wanna thank all of our panelists Chelsea, Melissa, Mahati, Michael, David, um, thank you so much for participating. We had a great conversation. Thank you for all of our participants for really being engaging today. Um, if you, uh, I think there's some links in the chat for how to get in touch with um, Chelsea and Melissa in particular, um, and also how to get some more information about MSF. SAEM, GEMA, and the Humanitarian Task Force, please feel free to reach out and connect to us um, to keep this conversation going about some of the issues that we talked today. So um, thank you so much, guys. <laughs>